Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Daily Gold YouTube channel. This video is being recorded on the late morning of Monday, October 21st, 2024. Thank you so much for joining me. In this video, guys, I have a special guest with me. We are talking Calibre Mining, a company that has been on fire this year. I just checked in from the February low. The stock up until a couple of days ago was almost up 150%. Uh, with me today from Calibre, he's part of the management team. He is Ryan King. His official title is Senior Vice President for Corporate Development. Ryan, first things first, I know I've, I've given you your flowers there, but you guys did have some negative news a couple of days ago on Friday, although the market was actually buying the weakness. That was nice to see. But could you talk about the uh, news release that you had and if that is going to have any lasting impact? Yeah, no, nice to be back on the the Daily Gold YouTube channel again, Jordan. Thanks very much for having us, and appreciate your uh, your audience and their uh, and their questions and their focus on caliber and the sector. But uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, we kicked off the year with the uh, closing of the acquisition of the Valentine Gold Mine uh, in Canada. That's a five million ounce resource based, and then we've been advancing that project through its construction period and. Uh, what we updated on Friday was um, was uh, a little bit on its construction, right? 80, through eighty percent through construction now of that uh, of that multi million ounce gold mine in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, but importantly, um, it, it's uh, it doesn't all go well or according to plan. Sometimes there's bumps uh, in the road. And what we announced to the market there on Friday was that the Valentine Gold Mines capex from our earlier uh, in the year announcement and update uh, went up from 650 to 744 Canadian million dollars. So our capital cost increased. Uh, and I, I would say predominantly due to um, some underperformance from our contractors, a slipping of the schedule in terms of the, the original plan. Uh, so what we've done regarding that is obviously the CapEx has gone up. Uh, but what we've done is uh, address that by bringing in some uh, owner team people to oversee different aspects of the construction and contractors. We've uh, we've increased resources, uh, manpower. Uh, we've increased and expanded the uh, temporary camp facilities, things like that to help accommodate, to adhere to our plan to Q2 2025 first gold production. Uh, so that happened on Friday, but at the same time on Friday, unfortunately, we didn't we did miss on our Q3 uh, gold production estimates, and we had to on the back of that revise our full year gold production uh, outlook. So originally, gold production was outlooked to be 275 to 300 thousand ounces of production, uh, and we revised down to 230 to 240 thousand ounces of consolidated gold production from Central America and from Nevada. And uh, some of that had to do with sm some small scale historical mining at one of the new pits. Uh, so right at the very top of these pits, sometimes you'll get small miners that can go down about uh, 10 to 15 meters or so below, uh, uh, below surface. And uh, we didn't estimate enough in the initial benches of, the, of that open pit of some of the small scale mining that had historically happened. So we lost about 15 to 20,000 ounces of gold uh, due to our underestimation there. Uh, but now we're through that and we've actually followed up with an infill drill program and confirmed the resource there. It's not a huge resource. It's about 160,000 ounces now down to about 140 from the original one. Um, but it's now completely aligning with our expectations and grades and tons going to the mill. So uh, on track there. Secondly, which led to the uh, revised guidance, was in Q2, don't know if you remember, but in Q2, we had one of our open pits had a, a little bit of wall movement on the, one of the open pits called the Mon Norte. And due to that, we had a delay. We had to resequence and reschedule different areas of the pit. And then we had to strip down that, that area. We anticipated more coming in in Q3 but in fact, due to uh, schedules and, and plans, more will actually come in in Q4 and we'll have a stockpile build. So it ends up being a delay of, uh, of ounce production um, from really from 2020, from Q3 and 24 into Q4. And then we'll see some 
uh, stockpile build actually to the tune of about 30,000 ounces build, but it doesn't get produced in 2023. So due to the sequencing in mine a schedule, as well as uh, this open pit called Vulcan, due to its uh, a reduction in ounces due to the small minor, historical small minor activity, that's what's led to the revised guidance. And, and so obviously that disappointed uh, analyst expectations and, and therefore the, the market expectations. But, but yeah, this is now behind us. So we've got a plan in place. We've, uh, we've made some changes to our, uh, our management team. We brought in a new chief operating officer, David Schumer, that uh, our chief executive officer, Darren Hall, worked with uh, for a number of years at Newmont. So they've known each other. Darren is a very high level of confidence with David Schumer. So he's spending majority of his time in Nicaragua. In fact, last week, once we put out this news, we actually had a conference call to address the news immediately. Uh, because it's important to, uh, to address this and, 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 and talk to your investors and stakeholders about what's happening. We did that. And David was, uh, was taking the call from Nicaragua. So he's there focused on operations, uh, making sure that we adhere to the plan. And what we announced in that, in that same press release was that um, in Q4, or sorry, in Q3, uh, we, we produced 36,000 ounces of gold uh, from Nicaragua. In Q4, we're now guiding the market that due to that delay in the sequencing, uh, we're now really focused on getting in the right, what's called face positions in the open pits. So assuming we, we get that plan in place and do that, which we're on now, uh, we should deliver 60 to 70,000 ounces, a, a significant increase in, in gold production in Q4 uh, and be back on track. So this should be behind us now uh, and we'll be in a good position to deliver on the expectations going forward. Just to follow up on that quickly. So this, I know you have not given out your guidance for 2025 yet, obviously, but you know, the market loves to look ahead. Sure. And so th this will not have any impact on 2025 operations. That's correct. No, in fact, uh, in, if anything, it, it may have a positive impact on 2025. Uh, I won't, I won't guide too much towards 2025 yet because we're still working through budgets and details. But given the fact that we're going to have a, a almost a 30,000 ounce stockpile build. Uh, so what that means is basically, you know, think of it just as a pile of, of uh, tons of, of material that doesn't go through the mill, right? Um, that doesn't go through the mill. So therefore, it's left for processing and production in 2025. And we'll manage that sequence throughout the year. But yeah, I think it, it should have, if anything, a positive impact on 2025. And so to, to follow up on Valentine Lake, so mostly due to contractor underperformance. So was this a an issue where uh, the contractors were just loafing a little bit or did, did, there, did you actually need to have more manpower to get the job done? Uh, I, I, I think it's a couple of things here. You know, Darren identified a bit of tension and pressure, um, you know, a couple of weeks back. Uh, we've actually actually changed out the construction director with an owner's team construction director now and, and, and construction managers to help with that process to adhere to the plan. Um, so it's a, it's a multitude of things that uh, it kind of came about, but uh, needless to say, we've identified it. Uh, we've actually probably proactively taken the approach of, yeah, we need to staff up, uh, bring in additional camp facilities and accommodations to make sure that we can have beds for everyone. Uh, but there was obviously some, um, some materials in that increased cost as well. Recall that back in May when we announced our, our capital cost update since we acquired the property, we actually bringing forward phase two uh, expansion uh, capital into this phase as well. So we've actually brought some capital forward to, to assist with the throughput in this phase one. So uh, our original throughput was 2.5 million tons per year of, of capacity. We believe because some of the materials we've brought forward into this phase that we should be able to push that a little bit, maybe 2.5 to 3 million tons of capacity by bringing in additional tankage and materials to help with that throughput. So um, some of that, some of our, our capital cost increase has to do with, you know, cement, power distribution, um, you know, some additional uh, effluent treatment plant work, et cetera that will uh, that will uh, benefit us in this in this first phase. And, and Ryan, can you talk about the current financial position of the company and how you could handle 
the the increased spending at Valentine? That's a an excellent question, Jordan. Um, you know, obviously impacted by the Q3 production and our cash flow, so we had our cash come down a bit. But uh, at the end of September, so the most recent quarter that you know Friday's news release was all about, we have uh, U.S. 115 million in cash sitting in our uh, on our balance sheet. We have U.S. 100 million dollars of restricted cash. So that's restricted cash is cash that is in the debt proceeds account for Valentine's uh, build in this initial uh, project capital construction period, and um, so combined we have 300 million Canadian uh, sitting on the balance sheet in, 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 in liquidity in order to build the Valentine. And what we said in that press release as well was that from now going forward to first gold for Q2 2025, it's about 197 million Canadian to complete to first gold. Uh, so we have sufficient liquidity on the balance sheet just in terms of our cash position and restricted cash in order to complete that build. So that doesn't that doesn't take into account, you know, uh, uh, what we would anticipate to be a much stronger Q4 and then production in 2025. Okay, and and staying with Valentine here, so it, it's slated to produce. I mean, based on the the study, uh, 195,000 ounces a year or thereabouts for a 14 year mine life. Ryan, I know that you guys. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I, I know that you guys see more upside to this project. Can you? Tell us what that means, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Uh, absolutely, and uh, no, this is this is all part of the reason I, I would say driven by what we believe is the potential here at Valentine. And uh, just for the audience, let me set a bit of context here because I think it's incredibly important. We're on what uh, what 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 appears to be a very prolific shear system, and a shear system is a fault, a big break in the earth that provides the plumbing for you know, uh, magma fluids to flow up. And a lot of times that'll collect different minerals, copper, uh, silver, gold, and in this case, it's gold. And this, uh, this, this uh, fault system has been traced well over 32 kilometers in the main fault on the Valentine uh, mineral concessions that we own. We've actually now mapped out a secondary fault uh, on the Northern part of the property that's also about 32 kilometers long that has zero exploration done on it. But on the Valentine Lake shear zone, uh, the previous owner, Marathon Gold, first discovered gold in 2011, 2012. And that was in, in the first pit, the, the Leprechaun pit, which, of course, is very advanced now and has uh, over 1.2 million ounces of mineral reserves. Well, the second deposit that was discovered due to outcrop, just like Leprechaun, was the Marathon pit. And that's about three kilometers to the north along this main fault. Right. That was discovered in 2015, 2016. So on the back of that discovery and then drilling it out, the Marathon Company then went ahead with a, a pre-feasibility study and started permitting those two pits. Right. Well, while they were drilling those two pits underneath cover, so there was no outcropping of mineralization underneath cover, they discovered the third pit, Barry, which was another million ounces of reserves. So now you have a three pit mine plan um, and, and of course now it's fully permitted, but now you have a three pit mine plan, but you only started exploring in about 2010, 2011, right? So something like as prolific as this type of geological setting in Ontario or in Quebec would have been, dis would have been explored for 100 to 150 years. So Valentine has only had exploration done on it since 2010, 2011. That talks about the, the very young evolution of what is very likely to be multi-million ounce uh, uh, upside opportunity on this, on this very, what looks like prolific uh, faulting system. So we saw that opportunity going through our due diligence and we saw the fact that, hey, a lot of the material had been, or, had been discovered based on outcropping. And there hadn't been a lot of additional exploration, none on the further northern shear, and, and only about six kilometers of the 32 kilometer shear system that is Valentine Lake has been explored. Well, now Caliber is exploring uh, along that full 32 kilometers to see what is to the south, what is to the north. Maybe there's some second order shears coming off of the main shears. 
So there's tremendous exploration upside. We've already talked about some of the uh, ore control drilling where we've had where we've discovered additional tons and we've had positive grade reconciliation. We've also talked a little bit about publicly about some exploration to the south of the leprechaun deposit where we've had some good success. So we've got now we currently have three diamond rigs turning on that property. We've got a few prospecting rigs turning on the property. We're doing uh, geophysical work on the property. So there's a huge amount of work happening underway now. And to your point now, why are we doing that? Because we're trying to assess what does Caliber's phase two uh, in terms of mill throughput and mining look like? You know, that'll help us inform the scale to scope out the right, uh, the right uh, mill to suit this type of size of property. And, you know, Darren will often say, you know, in 20 years from now, People will come back to us and say, well, why did you build it there? And why did you only build it to that size? Because our belief based on the geology is that we will continue to find more and it will be too small. But now what we're looking at is, is you know, a phase two that could be, you know, originally in the feasibility study, it was going to go up to 4 million tons of throughput. Now, because of our view and because of the continuous investment into the property and the exploration upside, you know, we're probably looking, we're going through technical studies now. Uh, so it's important to note that. But as we go through these technical studies, we're seeing an opportunity where maybe it goes to five or five and a half million tons of throughput. And if you were to take the average grade of the reserves and put that through, it is uh, it is a pretty significantly higher amount of production profile. But again, that's a forward looking statement. And, uh, you know, we're working through that now. And I would anticipate that, you know, that's probably going to be, uh, I would say, you know, as we engineer that and do those studies, we'll have some idea in 2025 what that looks like and then be able to, you know, march march forward on a phase two approach by 26, 27. Okay, that's great. Uh, you know, I love talking about exploration. Let's talk about the other projects in exploration. So um, Nicaragua, I know you're you're working through or you have worked through the issue there as far as production yeah. Uh, what about exploration? What's the exploration outlook in Nicaragua? How much money are you spending there right now drilling? Well, here's the thing about Nicaragua, and I think that um, it, it is really relevant, is that um, year over year in Nicaragua, we've seen reserve expansion. Um, you know, we acquired the assets in 2019. When we acquired them, the reserve base was only about 250,000 ounces of reserves, Right. We have spent between five and twenty million dollars a year in various exploration efforts, early stage uh, mapping, sampling, through to geophysics, through to obviously extensive amounts of drilling. Um, and and this year is no different. I think this year our budget in in Nicaragua was about twenty to twenty five million dollars uh, of drilling and exploration work. Again, it's through the whole pipeline, through through the whole evolution of the exploration stages to early stage mineral concessions and mapping, sampling to see if there's something of interest there, all the way through to, I think currently we have 13 diamond, diamond drill rigs turning there across multiple different concessions. And the reason we have it across multiple different concessions is as you recall, we operate a hub and spoke operation in Nicaragua. So we mine and haul up to 400 kilometers away from the central milling uh, processing capacity or processing facility, right? So very good infrastructure in country. You can mine and haul that material into the to those facilities, predominantly predominantly because the uh, the mineral uh, mineralogy here is low sulfidation epithermal veins, right? So these mills are set up for that type of rock, and so you can haul it from different sources that are low sulfidation veins, blend it, and put it through the mills. And uh, what's exciting there is we've had some tremendous hits, uh, hits drill results, right? Where we've uh, announced uh, a new discovery at Limon. That's where a lot of our drilling is happening right now. Limon has been in production since the probably the early 1940s. It's now produced over four and a half million ounces of gold. And we continue to find new vein systems on that property. Some that outcrop at surface, some that are under a bit of cover. Um, but one that we're really excited about now is an area called Talavera at the Le Mans complex. And Talavera is exciting because we've got some, we've had some great drill results. But importantly, 
it was a past producing mine. So there's a lot of under, underground infrastructure and it looks as though we've been finding some good extensions to this. Now we'll require refurbishment and dewatering, but nonetheless, uh, some excellent opportunities there. This mine produced 800,000 ounces of gold at eight grams per ton gold. And, uh, and, it, and it stopped in its operations in the early 2000s because of the lower gold prices. So now with the efforts we're doing in drilling and reinvesting back into the operations, uh, obviously uh, with the mill throughput capacity we have between Limon and Libertad, we can look at adding additional mines into our processing facilities because we have surplus milling capacity. Uh, so no, a lot of exploration work happening across the property. I mean, you take a step back in any mining company and yes, it's about cash flow. And yes, it's about delivering that cash flow. But really, what are we about? We are just, we are exploration companies. Some of us have, uh, you know, cash flowing exploration companies. Uh, but but uh, but fortunately for us, we are a cash flowing exploration company looking for these new uh, and 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 potentially multi million ounce deposits that can change the narrative of any of one of these companies and increase share price performance. And while we're on the topic topic of exploration, Ryan, I, I know that I'm not minimizing the Nevada operations. I, mean, I know you're you're focused on, uh, or it's less of a focus right now, I should say. But uh, just just give us a quick update. Tell us what's going on in Nevada with uh, the Pan Mine and uh, Gold Rock project. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, obviously a smaller portion of our production, but this this is a classic example of uh, regularly in meetings. This is a cash flowing exploration property. Right. So we produce between I think uh, revised guidance now is about 32 to 36,000 ounces there. Uh, it's a heap leach operation. And um, yeah, we've got two rigs turning there now. We've we recently announced some results in and around Pan. Uh, we're continuously drilling around Gold Rock. And just as a reminder, Gold Rock is a, is located about 15 kilometers away from Pan. Uh, it's not an it's not a current uh, mining operation. It's a past producing operation way back in the 80s, but it sits at about a uh, I think it's a 400 to 500 thousand ounce oxide predominantly oxide resource. Uh, sits at about 0.65 to 7 grams per ton gold. So um, it's almost double the grade of Pan, and Pan's producing there about 15 kilometers away. So. Yeah, drilling is underway. We actually discovered at the end of 22, early 23, we discovered some higher grade sulfides at uh, at Gold Rock. So we've been chasing that uh, over the last little while with one rig, but also looking for a near surface oxide mineralization that could add to the property. So now what we're doing is we're stepping back and I think I might've mentioned this uh, previously. We're doing some technical studies. We're also permitting to see could Gold Rock and that material and oxide be hauled over to pan and utilize that infrastructure in one management team. So that's one of the things we've been working on for a little while. I know that we, I think, I think we've recently had water and air permits awarded on that property. So we've been making some good progress on permitting uh, and some of these technical studies, but I'd, I'd caution that I don't think this is going to be a significant annual production increase. This is going to be more about mine life extensions there in Nevada. And obviously as you know, and based on Fraser Institute numbers and et cetera, Nevada is one of the best places to, to operate from a uh, jurisdictional perspective, but also because geology is fantastic in Nevada. It has proven that you can find uh, multi-million ounce deposits, and that's why we're drilling in Nevada, right? Yeah, love the Silver State. Uh, that's Nevada for you. Uh, okay, Ryan, let's talk about uh, the valuation, because this is something we talked about earlier in the year when you were on with me. And I remember saying, you know, Ryan, geez, the stock is so cheap. You know, you're you're just it, it's so cheap. Just look at the price to cash flow or the price to nav. You know, what is go it, it going to take to get the market to recognize this? Well, I think the market has recognized it because the stock's had a huge move. And that's not just the gold price. Uh, can you update us? I, I don't know if you have the numbers handy, yeah. but do you have uh, what the, the stock is currently trading at, I guess, versus sure. you know, earlier in the year? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think as of uh, September, uh, I'll give you an example. And, and this is a metric that mining companies will use and a lot of it's a financial metric that people will look at your price to your net asset value. Right. Um, uh, in our peer group. Uh, I, I often list about 10 different companies 
that are producing anywhere from 350 to 500,000 ounces of gold, right? And with multitude of jurisdictions, um, some in Mexico, some in Canada, uh, some in different parts of the world. So it's a quite a mixed bag. But being a diversified gold producer now, or we're going to be a diversified gold producer with the Newfoundland Asset Valentine, uh, I put us in that category. And right now, actually, when we look at our peer group, let, let's say Mexico, uh, Turkey, Greece, um, uh, Egypt, uh, Australia, Canada, um, Ecuador, various jurisdictions around the world, with uh, with with obviously different some sometimes different quality of assets, um, obviously is the case higher cost lower lower cost a, a mixed bag right. We trade at a 0.6 times price to net asset value, and the average peer trades at about 0.75 to 0.8 times uh, price to net asset value, with the highest in our peer group being uh, Lundin Gold or Alamos Gold that trade at uh, 1.4 times price to net asset value. So you can see there's still a tremendous opportunity. Even though we've had a good run, there's still a tremendous opportunity in front of us to you know, de-risk Valentine further by getting it to 100% completion and then into operation. So we've got a, we've got work to do to get us there, money to invest to get us there. But if we can and we deliver that, I think there's going to be an additional re-rate on the back of that delivery, plus any sort of exploration upside. As, a, as we've mentioned, we've been talking significantly about reinvesting into the assets from an exploration perspective. I think, I believe that if we do find something uh, whether it be Nicaragua, but probably a higher pri a higher priority is on the focus around Valentine. If we discover more mineralization there, I think immediately there's going to be a huge uh, a huge opportunity to re rate uh, on the back of that. So that's one metric. Another would be an enterprise value to ounce of production. So when we look at that, we're probably trading at uh, th three hundred thirty thousand. Sorry, three thousand. Uh, enterprise value to ounce of production. We're all hoping it'll go to 30,000, right? At some point in time. And whereas the peer group is trading somewhere around five to six, right? Uh, EV to ounce of production over 25 and 26 years. Uh, but the biggest thing out of all of this from a growth perspective, as you've talked about, Jordan, is that Caliber's growth profile in terms of ounces a year of, pro of, of production. Ours is a 75% increase in, in production growth with Valentine, of course, coming online versus the peer average is somewhere around 15 to 20, right? So we've got a big re-rate, obviously. We've got a higher risk profile as we de uh, deliver a new mine. But, uh, you know, given the management team's track record and what, what uh, you know, Darren operations at, uh, at Newmont for, for 30 years, uh, et cetera, I think uh, we're in good position to deliver this and, and realize that full, full potential. Yeah, and, and Ryan, just uh, one more follow-up and then I'll let you go. Um, so assuming everything goes to plan with Valentine, I mean, you're, you're going to be generating just some fantastic cash flow at these gold prices, really the, the whole company as well. Um, do you envision that you're going to plow even more of that capital back into exploration? I guess the, yeah. Do, do you yeah. see an even bigger budget for exploration over the coming years? Uh, my view, and I think our collective view here is that reinvesting back into the assets has the po uh, possibility and the potential to have the highest return. You know, people talk about dividends, which are nice. People talk about share buybacks, which are nice. But if we discover a multi-million ounce gold deposit, I think that our shareholders would benefit the most out of that because of the, the increase in NAV, but more importantly, the increase in, in what could this be? You know, as you drill into something, especially in an area where you have operations, call it Newfoundland on the Valentine Lake Shear or, or Nicaragua, it has the vast potential to, uh, to, to increase, increase production, to increase the, uh, obviously the excitement around what the potential could be. So yes, I, I, absolutely. Uh, particularly if we start to see success in any one of those areas, like, you know, a couple of years ago, Jordan, we didn't have 14, 13 drill rigs turning in Nicaragua. You know, we might've had four, five, you know, because of the expiration upside and because of what we're seeing in the drill bit, uh, we've been announcing results all year. We've been adding to that. And, you know, take, take for example, this year, we went into 2024 thinking we would probably do about 8 to $10 million 
uh, or it may be 30,000 uh, meters of drilling in Newfoundland. And now as of July, we announced a, an additional or expanded 100,000 meter drill program there because of the upside potential. And that is so critical for a mining company. It's like, you know, it's like a, a healthcare or a biotech company reinvesting in research and development. You have to do it, but you want to do it if you have a, a very good product. And I think that's uh, where we're leaning towards. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I mean, it's something I tell people, you know, because I love developers and producers, but find the ones that are are able to really invest significant cash flow in back into those operations via exploration. That's where you can get an even bigger return. So I, I completely agree with you. I love how focused on exploration you guys are, Ryan. Uh, before I let you go, uh, if our, any of our viewers want to contact you or the company personally, how can they do so? Sure. Uh, of course, we, uh, we're we an open uh, open book. So anytime someone wants to come and connect, obviously the best way would probably be our website, calibermining.com. There's an email address and contact information to contact me directly. Um, but you, you just reach out to my, my own personal email, rking at calibermining.com, and we can set up a call and and discuss uh, the business further. Ha happy to do that. Ryan, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate these updates that you provide me and my audience and uh, hope we can have you back maybe early next year and uh, see how Valentine uh, is progressing. Well, happy to be coming back here, uh, Jordan. And I would anticipate that be between now and the end of the year, or at least my hope is we've got a lot of exploration news to give to the market. And uh, we'll be talking about the upside of uh, Valentine again, in addition to what we've done here. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, man.